Anchorites. Uh, if you saw the title of this already, uh, we're calling it Underdogs, Three Amigos versus Angry King with Hot Oven. And uh, <laughs> this isn't an actual Three Amigos story, uh, but I'm calling it that because uh, if we called it its actual title, it would be way too long. It'd be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego versus King Nebuchadnezzar, a big gold statue, the astrologist, and a flaming hot furnace. And I just don't have enough character space to write that all out on IGTV. So we're going to call that Three Amigos versus Angry King with Hot Oven. Now we're wrapping up our underdog series tonight. And we've been going through uh, looking at some of the greatest underdog stories in the Bible. And we talked about Gideon versus the Midianites in a two-parter. Last week, JJ talked about Moses versus Pharaoh. And now here we are with a little story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, this story is found in Daniel chapter 3. And for those of you who grew up around the church, you've probably heard of the story. Um, and for the sake of ease, we're going to call Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego the three amigos, because you're going to get tired of hearing those names if I say their names every time in the story. So the three amigos, all right? Now, these three amigos, they were the Jews that had been taken captive by the Babylonians uh, after the Israelites were defeated in battle. And they were, they were part of this group of captives of these Jews. And um, the king, he took interest in these three dudes because they were really gifted and smart. So he placed them in these positions of government. And, and uh, so, some time goes by and people start to get really jealous of these three amigos uh, because the three amigos started getting a lot of influence and a lot of power in Babylon. And so a group of officials plot against them. Right? Like, man, jealousy is ugly and evil. I mean, have you ever had someone plot against you because they're jealous? Right? You have a friend that's jealous because you're in a relationship and so they try and, and, and tear it down. Or you may have a girlfriend try and steal your mans. Right? I mean, or you got a coworker that's mad that you're getting more hours or you got that promotion. And so they start smack talking you to all your other coworkers. Right? I mean, I, I bet, I bet a lot of us can say that we, um, we have faced some people who are jealous and try to tear us down, but I don't think a lot of us can say that our deaths were plotted against us by people around us, right? I mean, but that's where the three amigos find themselves. They're, they've been promoted to these positions of power in government, and as foreigners, all these people around them are, are jealous of their positions, so these jealous officials, they, these jealous officials, they go to the king and they kiss his butt, right? They do a little butt kissing. They're like, dude, King Nebuchadnezzar, bro, you're one bad hombre. You know what you should do? You should make a gold statue of yourself and have everyone bow down and worship it. And the king's like, wow, that's a great idea. Like a statue of me, what could be better? Right? And the officials, internally, these officials are rubbing their hands together because they know if you disobey a king's command, like bowing down and worshiping a statue, it means death. Disobeying a king means death. And they, they know that even though these three amigos were in a foreign country with foreign names, speaking a foreign language, they didn't serve a foreign god. They knew that the three amigos were faithful to their beliefs in a one true God and would not bow down to anything else but him. Right? So the king, he, he builds this big gold statue of himself, calls all his officials and leaders and tells them, hey, howdy, hey, bow down to me. Right? He says, he says hey, bow down to the statue. Okay? And here's where we pick up. If you have your Bibles, turn to Daniel, Daniel chapter 3 verse 8. Daniel chapter 3 verse 8. It says this, at this time some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. Right? They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you've set over affairs of the provenance of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you've set up. Man, these, this, these astrologers, man, they're like the class tattletales, right? They see you not doing something like, teacher, he's not doing it. That's what these astrologers, they're like, yeah, teacher, king, he's not bowing down. 
right? And this, this makes the king uh, super angry, right? King Neb is like furious. So he, he brings the three amigos before him. And he says, listen, you're going to bow down to the statue or I'm going to throw you into this fire. I don't think there's a whole list of things that are a lot worse than being burned alive, all right? I can tell you that, like, I, there's, like, probably a million ways I'd rather go than being thrown into a really hot furnace, okay? And, and, and then we pick up in, in verse 17, it's the, the three amigos reply with this. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you've set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. And the king's command was so urgent, and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. And King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. And king said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Now that's an underdog story right there, right? I mean, like these three dudes went up against a king in his very, very hot oven. And JJ made a point last week that I think we could easily apply to this story and we could make it the main point that it doesn't matter who or what you're up against. It matters who is in your corner. It doesn't matter who or what you're up against. It matters who is in your corner. See, it didn't matter that the three amigos were up against a king because God was in their corner. It didn't matter that the three amigos were up against flames so hot that they could kill you just for looking in their direction because God was in their corner. It didn't matter that they had some jealous co-workers trying to get them whacked because God was in their corner. I mean, Carol Baskin could have sued them for their zoo and they would have won because God is in their corner. See, when you have Jesus in your corner, there's not a thing or person that can come up against you where it won't work out. Why? Because God is on your side. But why? Why was God on their side? And and why would God be on yours? Romans 8, 28 says this, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Let me read that again. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. See, the three amigos never turned away from God. Under immense pressure from all sides, they, they, they still didn't turn away from God. They loved God even when it was life or death. They still held to their convictions. See, God was not a a genie in a bottle for them. They didn't call on him just when they needed him. See, they lived out their faith. And the truth is they, they could have saved themselves in that situation. 
It would have been easy for them. They could have just bowed down and been perfectly fine, not gotten anywhere close to that fire. But they actively loved God, and they held to his standards, and they they clung to his truths, and, and he protected them. See, I think we can easily take this God is on your side point and, 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 and run with that and make that the main takeaway here. But I think there's something deeper in this text. See, m- most of us probably won't face a day, especially living in the U.S., where we would be forced to bow down to a physical idol, right? But I think many of us are bowing down to some cultural pressures. Many of us are bowing down to cultural idols. See, the world around us is constantly pushing us to abandon our convictions. I mean, party culture in college is widely accepted and and perpetrated as the normal, right? uh, If you don't participate in it, then you're an outcast. If you're not going to party every night and barely waking up on time for class, like, you're just, you're not cool, I mean, there's, there's not just party culture, there's, there's hookup culture that tells us that if we're not having sex, then you are undesirable. And if you want to wait until marriage, then you're a weirdo, right? That's just, that's just how it is. And when we start bowing down to the cultural norms, rather than standing up with your convictions, it creates in us a divide. Let me say this, standing up for the things you believe in It doesn't mean you have to be some type of keyboard warrior on Facebook, right? You don't have to bash everyone who isn't like you. You don't need to start actively shaming others who don't believe the same as you. Uh, You you, you don't need to do that. But but when we start bowing down to the cultural norms, rather than standing up for our own convictions, it creates in us a divide. Hannah Montana, I, I know you've seen that show, right? My sister used to watch it all the time, and I would be lying if I... Said I didn't watch a few episodes, all right, it's a good show, you know what I mean? It's the best of both worlds. But, but the premise of that show is based around a girl who, who's a rock star, but who has a double life, right? She, she has an alter ego to, to her friends, and her friends know her as one person, but the world knows her as another, and, and, and she's, 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 she's living this double life. Her her friends don't know she's a rock star. Uh, Everyone doesn't know that she's kind of like a regular person on the side. And throughout the show, she struggles with the duality that her alter ego brings, right? She can't be fully Hannah. She can't be fully Miley, right? And when you don't live by the convictions that you have, let me say this differently. When you claim to be a follower of Jesus, when you take hold of the life that he's given you through his death and resurrection on the cross, you become a Christian. And it becomes a way of living that reflects Jesus that you are supposed to live by. Not because it's part of, of some rules for your salvation, but because there's a change inside you when the Holy Spirit comes into your heart. And when you start acting against the Spirit inside you, when you don't live by the convictions that you have, there becomes a divide. Who you are in Jesus and, and who you are acting like. It's a, it's a spirit, it splits your soul. It's a spiritual divide. And that's why you feel guilt or shame when you do something you know is wrong. And, and what happens when that happens? You either recognize your actions and you repent and you turn from those things and you move towards God or you continue to do the wrong things and move further away from Jesus. See, you have a decision to make every day. You either bow to Jesus or you bow to the world. And each time you bow to the pressures of unrighteousness, it pulls you further from right relationship with God. And that's the truth. I'm not sugarcoating it because because I think we need this in our culture, in our world right now, to know and recognize the difference between God's righteousness and the world's unrighteousness. See, for the three amigos, if If they chose to bow to that statue, they would be turning their backs on God and they would be turning their backs on what they believe in and it would heavily affect their connection with God. So we see that that God is in your corner and we see that we should stand for our convictions. And my last takeaway from the story is have friends that stand with you. Have friends that stand with you. See, these three guys, they they stood strong. These three amigos stood tall 
because they were not the uno amigos. They were not the dos amigos. They were the three amigos. Not only did they have God in their corner, but they had each other. See, I can't tell you how important it is to have people in your community, to have people in your corner that support you and stand with you in your beliefs. You and I, we were designed and made for community. We need it. And who we choose to be in our corner will affect us more than you think. I mean, they have the power to change our perspectives and, 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 and friends have the power to change who we become and how we handle adversity. And they can either cause us to grow in our faith or cause us to stagnate or walk away. I believe that if one of those guys bowed down, it could have caused the others to bow too. If just one of those three guys had bowed, it could have put pressure on the other two to bow. And how many times have you been influenced by the people around you, by your friends around you? And when you have people around you that are standing in their beliefs with you, it makes it a whole lot easier for you to stand. See, they, they say that bad company corrupts good character. So how much better will good company uplift good character? See, when you feel like an underdog, take into account this story that these three guys had God in their corner, and that you have Jesus, and you have the ability to have good community, and you can stand against anything this world throws at you. One of my favorite things in this whole story comes from, uh, comes from the verse in, where they say that, that God is going to save them, but even if he doesn't. That God will save them, but even if he doesn't. They, they believe so strongly that God was good, that even if he doesn't protect him, that he's still good, that they will still be faithful to him. Man, I pray that we have that faith today, that we would be able to pray prayers and say, God, if you can do this, that would be amazing. But even if not, we would still love you and we still trust you. That is an underdog story right there. But God is in your corner. Don't forget it. Let's pray. Lord, we just uh, lift up this message to you. We lift up this story to you. God, thank you for including these in the Bible, Lord. God, thank you for showing that you are faithful, that you are a good, just God, Lord. God, I pray that you surround each of us with a community that it takes to stand in our beliefs, Lord that we'd be able to stand strong in our convictions, in our beliefs, Lord, and stand strong in you and who you are and who you've made us to be. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining us this week. This is our last week of doing online only. On Tuesday the 30th, next Tuesday, we're doing a worship night in person in the Student Center. Come at 7 o'clock. You're not going to want to miss it. It's going to be absolutely amazing. We're going to be, do, be doing some hangout afterward. And then uh, the week after, on the 7th of July, we will not be meeting. There's not going to be uh, no digital, nothing. But then the 14th, we're going to be starting back up again regularly, having our regular Tuesdays in the Student Center. And we'll still be doing some online stuff for those of you um, who are not ready yet to join us. Um, but for those of you who are, we can't wait to see you.